Oh, I got a clicker. Yep. Um, is this thing on, John? We're good to go. We're good to go. All right. Okay, very good. Uh, so that's me. I'm Dr. Taylor, Matt Taylor, talking about running injuries. Um, a little bit about prevention of running injuries, more so about the different types of injuries that you can experience, and sort of a brief overview of how we treat those injuries. I have a lot of injuries on here, um, so we may briefly touch on some of them. Um, if there's anyone that you're particularly interested in, we can spend a little more time on that potentially if you desire. Okay? So, got to turn it on. That's, hey, could you open that? So this is just, you know, running injuries come in many different ways. So hopefully this will work. Um, I thought this happened here in Oregon, but uh, it looks like it was actually in Pennsylvania. There. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this video. But, you know, like I said, running injuries can happen in any way. So a little runner there gets taken out by a deer. So. I thought, I always think, when I think of running injuries, that's one that always comes to mind. Oh, yeah. But yeah, that's the. <laughs> that's loose running injury. Yep. All right. And then there's all other kinds of running injuries. Okay? So hopefully nobody experiences this. Um, you Google running injuries, you see some funny things. So, um, anyway, so this is me, Matthew Taylor. Um, I am a primary care sports medicine specialist, which means that I did a family medicine residency and then I did a special fellowship in sports medicine. And in doing so, I added these extra letters after my name, but I have what's called a certificate of ad added qualifications in sports medicine. Um, you have to do the fellowship to take that test to say that you're a sports medicine specialist. Um, I work here at the Corvallis Clinic in the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. I'm a teen physician at Western Oregon University, and I cover, and I cover Philomath High School and South Albany High School as well. And I apologize, I have had a cold, and we'll see what happens. Um, <clears throat> so running injuries, we can kind of break it down into a number of uh, categories. I think this is kind of a simple way of looking at it. Vast majority of running injuries are going to be overuse injuries. You're out there pounding the pavement all day or you know, for long periods of time, you're going to run into overuse injuries. Other injuries can occur, and can occur acutely. Sometimes they're due to just training errors or doing something wrong or foolish. Um, other times you're doing everything right, but it still happens. You still get injured. Overuse injuries um, can be, well, injuries can be divided into Macro trauma and micro trauma. So this would be an example of macro trauma. Okay, you know, a structure suddenly goes because the whatever forces that were applied to it were too strong for it to handle. Okay, so again, you Google that kind of stuff, you can see some crazy things. Um, overuse micro trauma. So micro trauma is more classically what we think of with overuse injuries. So what happens is that there's this microscopic subliminal injury from repeated activity. So basically, you're stressing a structure over and over and over. Every time you stress it, you cause a little bit of damage to it. If you do forces that are, you know, mild or moderate and your body is able to heal that injury, then the structure doesn't break down. It does fine. If you are doing too much cumulatively, the body doesn't have a chance to heal all the injury that you're incurring with every run or whatever it is that you may be doing. And so you keep doing it, you keep doing it, well then it starts hurting, but you keep going and eventually you'll not only have it start breaking down, but it can fail. Okay, and you can see like this is just an example of, you know, a muscle is, you know, the basic units of muscles are very, very small. And you know, you get bigger all the way to the actual muscle and then the tendon and the bone where it attaches to. You can have overuse injuries or st stress injuries of any of those structures. Sometimes there are things that you really can't change, you know, just the way you're built, the way your body is. Even though some things, even with malalignment and muscle imbalances and things like that, you, you can work on and you can fix. Other times there's completely extrinsic factors. So you're doing things wrong or you're doing things foolishly and that's what leads to your injury. So bad technique, training error, you know, not being cautious with the type of environment, all those things can lead to injury. 
Um, so first off, just a generalized treatment. Um, some of the things that we do for overuse injuries, sort of we do for across the board depending upon, I mean regardless of what kind of injury it is, whether stress fractures or sprains or whatnot, we do some of the things commonly. Uh, rice or they expanded to it to prices. So this is just kind of a classic uh, mnemonic to help you remember. Protect, rest, ice, compression, elevation, support. So basically, fairly common sense things to do when you have an injury. Um, I would tell you that everybody wants to slap ice on everything. I don't put a lot of stock in icing or heating injuries very much. I don't think it makes a huge difference. Um, I don't stress it. If you're you know, worried about, oh, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off. You know, if you don't feel like icing makes a huge difference at all, then I don't feel like you need to even bother with it. If you're one of those people that feels like ice makes it feel way better, then keep doing it. It's fine. Um, theoretically, icing and other types of treatments could actually impede healing process, healing processes. So it's just one of those things that's ingrained in our, in our uh, culture to ice everything. And you know, it's not necessarily the best thing in the world. Okay? Same thing goes with a lot of these. Um, you know, they may make a subtle difference. They may not make a huge difference. I see people all the time that say, well, I iced it and I elevated it, Doc. Why didn't it go away? Well, that's not necessarily going to be the ultimate answer all the time. Okay? Rest. Um, rest is a very important part when it, when it comes to running injuries. I see most of the running injuries I see are people that, yeah, it hurt, and they just decided they were going to run through it or they rested it for a day, or they rested it for a week, and they, you know, why isn't it better? I rested it for a week. Well, oftentimes it takes a lot more than that, okay? Um, so there's multiple different ways to look at rest. You can rest by just sort of decreasing the intensity of what you're doing. You can keep running if it's not that bad, but decrease your intensity, your frequency, the duration at which you run, et cetera. Um, you can talk about complete rest, which is totally shutting you down. I try very hard to avoid shutting people down from any sport because that's what people like doing and it's good exercise and it's good for your overall health. But if that sport or that activity is leading to problems, then you might need complete rest. More often than that, I use or I recommend relative rest. That means finding activities that you can do that are not painful, that don't hurt, that are not stressing the same structure over and over and over. I always tell everybody, especially for runners, try biking, swimming, or elliptical. And those are great ways to continue to get cardiovascular exercise without the impact on your joints or whatever structure may be injured. Doesn't work for everybody, but that's, that's a starting point. Um, briefly on treatments, uh, medications such as NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, your ibuprofen, Tylenol, Aleve, those things can help with pain and discomfort. And, there are other types of modalities, heat, ice, cold, whatever, iontophoresis, ultrasound, stem. I usually defer those things to our physical therapists to do. Um, exercises and stretches, I send a lot of people to physical therapy. A lot of the times that's what people need is that extra guidance on, okay, what should I do, what shouldn't I do? Okay, this exercise hurts, so let's modify it and we'll do it this way to help you get better. So I, I, I strongly believe in physical therapy as a very important modality to help with these types of injuries. Um, other things that we do, injections, braces, supports, and even sometimes surgery. We try and avoid surgery if at all possible, but sometimes that is the only answer. Okay? I've got a number of braces and devices and things like that that I can talk about with these various problems and we can show you what kind of the intent of each of those is. So for treatment, those are kind of the broad things that we do for most of these running related injuries and I'll get into a few specifics as we go through. Um, in talking about prevention, I think we can kind of tailor our, well, we can take what we've learned in the previous discussions and kind of model our prevention strategies after those things. So the first lecture that we had from Michael Johnson, the Western Oregon track and field cross country coach, one of the things that he talked about is what is your goal in running? If your goal is exercise and health, then running through pain, probably not necessary cross-training, finding other non-painful activities to help with your overall health, more important, okay? If your goal is to win the 
run for the health of it 5K, then you gotta, you gotta push sometimes a little harder, okay? Um, prevention, proper footwear, where, the, where, the, where your feet hit the road, basically. Um, footwear is very important when it comes to preventing running injuries, okay? There's lots that can be said about that. We had a whole lecture about that and, and footwear in general. Um, and then Paul talked about flexibility, strength, and control. So if you're flexible, if you're strong, if you have control, if you have proper technique, running gait and mechanics, those are ways that are going to help prevent injury as well. Then for me, kind of the, the simple things that I like to say is don't push through pain. If it hurts, there's a reason usually your body's telling you something's wrong. Don't just keep running through it. That's where most of the running injuries I see are is that something hurt but kept going. Okay. Um, be evaluated. A lot of the times people will just stop what they're doing and rest. That's not always the answer. It's a very good option, but that doesn't always take care of it. And so being evaluated by somebody who is experiencing dealing with these types of injuries is also a good idea. And then one thing I tell people as well is the longer it's been a problem, often the longer it is going to take to get better. So if you've been having this knee pain for years and kept running through it, a week of rest usually is not going to take care of it. So it may take a little longer than most people want. Okay, <clears throat> so talking about some specific injuries and some specific structures. Um, one of the first things we talk about is a stress fracture. So that's a fracture of a bone, okay? A stress fracture is an example of that micro trauma that we talked about, where the cumulative forces over time basically become too much for the structure, okay? Most commonly we see it in the small, well, the long bones of the feet. These are called the metatarsals, okay? You can imagine your foot's hitting the road with every step, a lot of stress up and down through that metatarsal bone. Initially it starts as pain, maybe some swelling. Oftentimes people will be seen and will do x-rays and it looks perfectly normal because that's an early stress fracture or what we call a stress reaction. Sometimes you just can't see the fracture yet even though it's in the process of developing. The main treatment for stress fractures is rest. Rest until it doesn't hurt. Uh, that may be just taking time off from running, maybe just wearing normal shoes. Most of the time, if I'm really concerned about a stress fracture, I'll put someone in one of these lovely shoes. Um, I call it a fracture shoe. It's called a post-op shoe by some people. Basically, what it is is a sandal, a very attractive sandal with a perfectly stiff sole. Okay? So you can't really bend it. So that when you walk, instead of your foot sort of doing this rolling motion as you walk, you have to kind of walk like you're walking on a plank. And it takes the stress and the tension across the structures of the foot, basically allowing it to rest. Also, you can't really run when you're wearing this, so it helps the patient to remember to rest. Most of the time, a period of four to six weeks, something like that will heal and do just fine. So that's a metatarsal stress fracture. Other bones obviously can get fractures as well. The uh, tibia and the fibula are the bones of the lower leg. The tibia absorbs 85, 90% of your weight. The fibula is really not a weight-bearing bone. So you don't usually get stress fractures here, more commonly in the tibia, but it can occur really anywhere. Again, this is the same process. Those microtraumas lead to failure over time. Oftentimes you can't see it on x-ray. Sometimes you see subtle hints of it. Sometimes it's pretty obvious. Okay. Treatment for this, rest till it stops hurting and then gradual resumption of activity. I think an old school method of treating these was the big boot that you see people wearing sometimes. Um, I try not to use the boots because they can lead to other problems and they're big and heavy and nobody likes them. A more recent treatment option is one of these which is called a long leg pneumatic compression splint or a long leg air cast. The theory behind this is that the cause of the stress fracture isn't just the impact when you run but it's the vibrations up the bone with each impact. And so this dampens those vibrations because of the air padding in it. So it dampens those vibrations, decreases the stress, decreases the risk of a stress fracture. Also, you can wear it in a normal shoe, so it's more tolerated or better tolerated than the boot. Typically, again, four to six weeks of healing. 
basically resting till the pain's gone, and then you can resume activity slowly or gradually once again. So that's one that I will use quite frequently for lower leg stress fractures. If you were wearing that brace, um, would you just like walk around normally? Like, mm -hmm. It wouldn't be like an issue. Wouldn't Nope, nope. So, I mean, I take people out from running, yeah, but yeah. I, I, allow, I allow them to wear the brace and just walk normally. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so when you wear the boot, you're still walking around usually normally. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, most of the time it's, it's just a lot better tolerated because it's not as big and heavy and you can wear a normal shoe. Yeah. And it can kind of fit under clothing, so it's a lot less conspicuous that way. So. That's the treatment that I will generally use. <clears throat> Femurs, so big thick bone, thigh bone, does not get stress fractures very often, but it does happen and I've seen it. Uh, I've seen it in people that had this hip pain, just kept going, kept running through it, thinking it'll go away. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, multiple different types of stress fractures of the femur. These are, well, I mean that's obviously the worst, but tension versus compression. When you're, when you're running and impacting the forces of stress on the top of your femur are pulling the bone apart. Okay, The forces on the bottom of the femur are pushing together. So this is a much better fracture pattern than this. Uh, the compression ones heal better than the tension ones. Um, Nobody ever should have a femoral stress fracture. That just usually means you've been pushing through some pain and working way too hard. So I don't see that very often, but it, it can occur. Okay. All right. Um, shin splints. Everybody's heard of shin splints, right? I see shin splints in the office, but I, you know, when somebody comes in and says shin splints, I don't know what that means. Okay. There's lots of different things that could be shin splints. Okay, tibial or these stress fractures, that could be shin splints. So I usually think of three common problems when somebody says I got shin splints. Stress fracture of the tibia, something called medial tibial stress syndrome, and then something called exertional compartment syndrome. So we already talked about the stress fractures. Medial tibial stress syndrome is, again, an overuse injury where muscle attaches to a bone it attaches not directly into the bone itself, but onto the lining of the bone called the periosteum via little fibers that connect. And every time you use that muscle, every step you take, those fibers and that muscle is pulling on that periosteum. And if it pulls over and over and over, you get inflammation and irritation of that periosteum where the muscle attaches, and that leads to pain and discomfort. There's lots of different places where it can occur, but generally we see it along the inner thigh where most people think of shin splints, or sorry, inner lower leg um, where people think of shin splints. And so that's probably the most common cause of shin splints. Okay? It can occur on the inside, the outside, sometimes around the back of the bone. Um, treatment for that is generally rest, anti-inflammatories, stretching or stretching those muscles so that there's less tension pulling on it. Um, activity modification obviously. Um, generally, you can continue to try and exercise, but cross-train with this type of an injury, and we can usually get that one to go away. Exertional compartment syndrome is a totally different phenomenon. Okay, inside your well, your leg, but in other areas as well, you have these um, <clears throat> compartments. We call them. So there's muscles that are lined by a thick tissue called a fascia. Okay, that fascia does not expand, doesn't open and any further, so it's basically a, a limited space. When a muscle pumps really hard, it increases the blood flow to the muscle so the muscle can swell a little bit. So when a structure inside a closed space swells, the pressure goes up. Okay? If the pressure in the muscle goes up too high, then the blood flow can't get to that muscle. And then the muscle starts basically being starved of oxygen. It's like having a heart attack of that muscle. And that leads to pain and discomfort. And that's exertional compartment syndrome. Okay? Much less common, but it does occur generally in runners. Shin pain, anterior leg pain, pretty severe pain. The interesting thing with this one is that it typically occurs in a set or an exact pattern every single time. So people know I get a mile into my run and that's when the pain hits. 
that pain lasts while I'm running, while I'm active, shortly thereafter the pain goes away and is gone. So that's the typical pattern that we see for that. If we do diagnose that one, generally the treatment is going to be surgical. We have to basically do what's called a fasciotomy and slice open that fascia so that when the muscle does swell, uh, the, the pressure doesn't go up. Okay, So that's one that you know, nobody wants to get. but. Uh, can be treated. Telephomoral pain syndrome, kneecap pain, very common problem. This is probably one of the most thing, one of the most common things that I see in my patients. Um, what happens is that with every step you take, every time you bend your knee, your kneecap travels up and down this groove in the femur. Okay, it's controlled mostly by your quads, your thighs. If there's a muscle imbalance in your thigh, or for whatever reason, sometimes you can get rubbing or friction of the undersurface of the patella in that groove, or one side or the other of the groove, which leads to friction, pain, discomfort. So, <coughs> excuse me. With increased activity, there's generally increased pain. <coughs> and it really can hurt a lot. So typically what we do to treat this one is correct that muscle imbalance. Usually it's an inner quad muscle weakness as compared to the outer quad. So if we strengthen the inner quad with specific physical therapy exercises, that generally resolves that issue. Okay. There are lots of other treatments that can be done, but this is a brace that I really like that I think works very well for this problem specifically. Um, it's called a reaction brace. It's designed to pull the kneecap anteriorly or away from the groove to result or to diminish the, the, the friction and the, the the rubbing against the uh, against the femur and it works pretty well so this is one of those braces that I will prescribe very frequently as well and then I'll send them to PT usually where they get better as the brace doesn't solve the problem it only just helps alleviate the pain while you're being active okay there's a million types of tendonitis, okay? You can have it anywhere. Uh, so since we're talking about running injuries, obviously we're going to talk about lower extremity tendonitis generally. There's so many different ankle ligaments, or excuse me, ankle tendons that can develop tendonitis. Very commonly you'll see it in the perineal tendons. Um, this is just showing the outside of the ankle. I've got another picture in a second that shows the inner part. But perineal tendons, Achilles tendons, uh, extensor digitorum tendon, all these tendons can develop pain. It's that same microtrauma, too much activity leading to the tendon to start having problems, getting pain, swelling, inflammation, starting to break down. Usually the treatment is anti-inflammatories and rest. Okay? But there's other things that can be inflamed and irritated as well. Tendons tend to run in tendon sheaths. Okay? And there's another structure in a lot of places called a retinaculum. All of those things can get inflamed. Okay? Uh, the retinaculum is designed to usually pre prevent bow stringing of a tendon so that when you use it, it doesn't pop out, okay? But they can all become inflamed. Uh, as you can see, there's, there's very many different tendons that they can all get injured. On the inner part of the ankle, posterior tibialis tendon is one that's commonly inflamed and irritated, uh, but a lot of different ones can't be. Plantar fasciitis. Technically, I think it's actually a ligament because it's connecting between two bones. Dr. Murphy talked at length about plantar fasciitis a couple weeks ago. Very common running problem. The plantar fascia is designed to help support the arch of the foot. With every step you take, your foot wants to flatten out. And so that plantar fascia is there supporting it. But repetitive strain and stress can cause pain and inflammation across the plantar fascia. You can get tears even. Um, typically, the treatment is rest anti-inflammatories and arch support under your foot helping prevent the flattening with each step. Okay, You have to bear with me on this one. So I use arch supports. I recommend them all the time. Um, you can get relatively good ones and you can get really cheap ones. Okay? The cheap ones usually don't provide a lot of support. They're more just the cushion feels a little squishy, feels a little nice when you walk on it, but doesn't really provide the arch support. So you invest a little bit more money, you get one that will truly support your arch, and that's one of the ways of resolving this issue. 
Dr. Murphy talked about a way to splint it at night. Um, he showed us a, a sock Velcro strap kind of a splint. It works. I find that most people tend to overpower that when they sleep at night. So if I have somebody that I need to prescribe or recommend night splints, I usually recommend a more hard posterior splint at that 90 degree angle, keeping that foot at 90 degrees so that overnight the plantar fascia and the tension across the, heli the Achilles, it, it gets a chance to heal overnight instead of in, in a stretched position rather than a relaxed position and so it helps it heal better. Okay, And so the first step you take when you stretch it back out again, it doesn't re-injure it and become super painful once again. <clears throat> IT band syndrome, very common problem. So there's a muscle called the tensor fascia lata, which then forms the iliotibial band, cross, crosses over the lateral hip and over the lateral knee. And with the running motion, you can get friction between the muscle and the bone at both of those spots. And so repetitive friction, again, leads to that injury and that pain and discomfort. Okay? This one is a pretty common problem as well. Typically, the treatment for it is going to be stretches. It's not very easy to stretch. Anybody heard of foam rollers? Yeah, people hate foam rollers. Yeah. Um, that's one way to help sort of massage and stretch out the IT band, okay? Rest anti-inflammatories. I will do steroid injections for this problem as well, so um, it can be a, a very painful problem, but generally it's another one that we can usually resolve with, with time and therapy and, and rest. Trochanteric bursitis is sort of a related problem. In between that IT band and the bone, there is a bursa which is designed to be sort of a shock absorber or decrease that friction <coughs> in time or with repetitive motion or with contusions or trauma. That bursa itself can become inflamed and irritated and then you get pain at the bursa. So it's very similar to the IT band. Hamstrings. You can get acute tears of a hamstring just with running and activity. I see a lot of runners that are long-term runners that develop sort of that chronic wear and tear of the tendon over time and it just starts breaking down. Oftentimes you'll see that right where it attaches up by the butt. Okay. Um, you can get it down by the tendon where there's sometimes complete tears. Okay. Uh, very painful problem. Very I mean, it often takes a long time to treat these issues. I tell people that have hamstring injuries that it can derail a whole season in a sport or a whole year from activity because you may be feeling good and you start going back out there to do your activity and that pain can just come right back. Uh, but generally, treat it with rest time, anti-inflammatories, strengthening exercises, and PT to resolve it as well. We do a couple of different specialized treatments, something that I do called platelet-rich plasma injections and dry needling can help with some of the chronic tendon changes that just don't resolve with our conventional treatments. So some of those things can be done. Ankle sprains, this is one of those more of a macro trauma or an acute thing that happens. So very common in runners, uh, in any sport or any athlete really. Just roll the ankle. The ligament that's designed to stabilize the ankle can get stretched, can get partially torn, can get completely torn. Generally, the foot is rolled in or <coughs> inverted, and it's quite painful. Usually it's not a significant injury, though, otherwise. There are a lot of uh, other injuries that will mimic, <coughs> excuse me, that will mimic an ankle sprain or that can occur concurrently with an ankle sprain, such as a ligament tear or a tendon tear and things like that. So not every ankle sprain is truly an ankle sprain. Uh, most of the time these are just rehabbed. The sooner you start walking on an ankle sprain, actually the better you are. Using an ankle brace to just support the ankle, but continuing to walk on it is usually the treatment. Sometimes we'll have to do physical therapy for an ankle sprain that's just not resolving. Uh, this is one that's kind of uh, geared toward the kids. Um, an apophysitis. So an epiphysis is a growth plate or an area where a bone is still growing. 
So there's cartilage as opposed to just solid bone. It's at the long or the end of bones where they're elongating and also sometimes where tendons or ligaments attach to a bone. There's another kind of a growth plate. And so if you put stress across that, the weak spot of that whole mechanism is the growth plate. <coughs> Excuse me. So kids get what's called an apophysitis or inflammation across the growth plate. Adults, <coughs> excuse me, because adults generally don't have the growth plate any longer. Adults will get the tendonitis rather than the apophysitis. Okay, I didn't talk about patellar tendonitis, but patellar tendon is a, one of those other tendonitises that we can develop. This is a little more, um, a little less common one. It's called a Morton's neuroma. So what you have in between the bones of your foot, the long bones, the metatarsals we talked about before, you have these nerves that run in between there. And every time you take a step, your foot wants to splay outward a little bit, okay? If you just overdo it, with every step you can start pinching that nerve that runs in between the bones, then it becomes inflamed and irritated and then becomes significantly painful and that's what's known as a Morton's neuroma, okay? <coughs> Part of the problem where runners get this is if they're not using shoes that have a wide enough toe box so that the foot can flatten out with each step. So not enough width there, not enough splay, more continuous or frequent pinching of that nerve, pain and discomfort, typically felt as a burning pain sort of in the web space between toes, okay? Same treatment, rest, anti-inflammatories, giving it time to heal. But one of the things that we do for this problem is a metatarsal pad, which you can stick in your shoe or in an orthotic, something like this. The intent of that is to put a pad under those metatarsal bones so that it already splays them out a little bit more. And so that when you do run, there's a little more space in between them, so there's less pinching on that nerve. Okay, this is one that if it doesn't resolve with conventional methods, sometimes steroid injections and even surgery is needed for that. Um, this is something I pulled that I forgot to talk about. Um, this is what I use uh, for some of those tendonitis of the foot. So this is called a wedge or a medial or lateral wedge. So these tendons help pull the foot either in or out, invert or evert the foot. Sometimes just because of your shoes or your running technique, you've got no extra pull across this tendon and the tendon becomes irritated, one of the causes of tendonitis. So if we put a little bit of a wedge under your foot on the inside or the outside, in this case the outside, it will elevate that lateral part of the foot slightly which will take some of the tension off of the tendon and enable that to heal a little better or a little quicker. So I'll use those frequently for people as well. All right, and then I think I just have one more slide. Other foot problems, yep. Um, so I don't profess to be the expert on, on runners and, and you know the skin issues and things like that, but you can get just black and blue under your nail if you're running for an extended period of time. You can get some bleeding under the nail, okay? Sometimes you lose your nail because of that. This is a condition called talon noir, which means black heel. And they think that this is just due to compression of blood vessels and it's basically blood vessels, or excuse me, blood cells being broken down and then sort of pushed out into the skin, leaving like a bruised appearance. So if you're ever running and suddenly you look like you have these black dots on your heel, that may be what it is, talon noir. Obviously blisters can occur. Uh, I don't specialize in treating blisters. I think everybody can handle their blisters. One of the things I say is don't pop your blisters because it's like a natural band-aid. So let it kind of heal and calm down on its own. And then I included this one because I think this is an example of what can happen with like nail care. I think this guy probably developed this problem because his nails were a little too long. And so if you're running and your toenails are rubbing up against the front of your shoes, so maybe your toenails aren't that long, but your shoes are too small, then that's that micro trauma with every step, putting some tension and pull on that nail, causing it to 
eventually sort of start elevating and then the blood fills in in that empty space or that vacuum and then you can develop this kind of a thing. It's painful and then toenail eventually falls off but usually a new one grows back. All right, um, those are the running injuries that I had, briefly talking about treatment for each of them. Uh, does anybody have any specific questions or injuries they want to talk about? Good question. Um, if you're <coughs> flat-footed, are you, in general, more prone to injury than if you're like, uh, like in the middle? Not like high arch, not flat-footed, but like in the middle? Uh, my opinion on that is I've seen many, many people that have terrible fat feet that have never had any real foot problems or other problems. I'll see them for their knee or their hip or an acute injury or whatnot, and they've got really flat feet, and I'll ask them, oh, do your feet ever bother you? And they say no. So realistically, I think a good amount of, you know, a, a judicious amount of exercise and activity like a normal person should be doing and if you have flat feet or not, you're probably going to be fine. I don't think you're more prone to injury. Now, you're going to be more prone to potentially specific problems, such as a posterior tib yeah. abnormality or tib pain or whatnot, posterior tibialis tendon pain. But overall, in general, I don't think so. But that's just kind of my personal experience with seeing you know, patients with those conditions. I don't ever recommend, so if somebody doesn't have foot problems, or other pain or discomfort, but hey, I got flat feet, what should I do, doc? I don't ever do anything. I just say, nope, nope, keep doing what you're doing until it starts giving you problems. If somebody does have the pain, then you know, I'll, put it, I'll give them the arch support or whatnot to try and fix the problem. But eventually, if that pain goes away and they want to wean their way out of the arch supports and get back to what they were doing before, I think it's fine to try. And if the pain never comes back, then there's no reason to keep using the arch supports. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions, injuries people want to ask about, talk about? <coughs> There's lots of other ones that you know we, we could talk about. Back pain, hip pain, things like that. Um, what about just cramps in general? Ah, oh, cramps. Um, <laughs> Great question. <laughs> oh, cramps. <laughs> so, um, cramps are usually a symptom of dehydration or doing something new that you're just not accustomed to. So, you know, you start doing a new form of exercise, those muscles that you exercise are the ones that are more likely going to cramp that night, okay, or, or whenever. Um, if you're truly getting dehydrated, exercising in excessive heat, etc., then you're more likely to get muscle cramps in general as well. Um, there, I think there's been a lot of studies done on cramping. I don't know that there's a whole lot of evidence that one way or the other that there's treatments and things like that for it that work really well. I remember I was, you know, doing a blood test for somebody who has cramping to see if there's something up with their potassium, their sodium, their calcium, and whatnot. I don't think we ever really found anything. Um, I tell people, uh, you know, make sure that you're hydrated, number one. Make sure that you're stretching you know, warming up and then stretching after an exercise, if, especially if it's something new. Um, and then just kind of monitor it and hopefully as you become accustomed to the exercise, the cramping should go away. Not a very specific answer though. <laughs> but I don't know, do you guys deal with cramps a lot? I think when I first like, if I don't run for like a month or so, the first like run or two, I'll have cramps, like just a side stitch. But then after that, I'm like pretty much good to go. Like yeah. you were saying, if it's like something new or something like I haven't done in a long time, I don't get a cramp. But then after that, I'm pretty much fine. Yeah. I feel like it, yeah, it's it just, I mean, electrolytes, hydration. Um, sometimes too, that muscle just isn't used to having to store that much glycogen, right? You know, to, to work. So it runs out of its stores like pretty quickly and that kind of causes some of the cramping so just make sure that you're like eating after you work out and you're replacing that energy that you just expended yeah but ultimately the muscle should become accustomed to the activity and then the cramping should yeah. go away yeah okay anything else a couple of weeks ago the top of my foot 
got sore and I read that it can be your shoes are too tight so I loosened them the next time and I know I was late. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine, that's fine. So, so I, I, the, the way I learned about that was in hockey players, they call it skate bite, okay? That might be what's going on. So first off, you've got these tendons that run to the toes, extensor digitorum, they extend the toes. You also have the tendon sheath that it can run in, okay? And then the retinaculum that goes over the top that keeps it up against the bone so that again it's not bow stringing outward. So anything that causes excess pressure over the top of your foot, you know, your tendon wants to glide under the skin and through that sheath and under that retinaculum, but if the shoe is compressing all that stuff together, there's going to be more friction and more pain. And when hockey players lace up their skates and they got a big old knot there in the front and big old laces that's pushing against all of this, that's when they get more friction and more pain. So having more loose over the top of your shoes, not lacing it too tight. That's one way to go about treating it. But otherwise, usually it's rest, anti-inflammatories, time. One of the things that you may want to consider is have you added more arch support or an insert into your shoe because you can crowd your foot that way. If you put too much in there on the bottom, then you have less space on the top. So anytime I instruct somebody to use an arch support, make sure you pull out that worthless insole that's already in there before you put in the arch support. Otherwise, you're going to crowd it, and you can get that as a problem. Yeah. Well, I've had a similar, my right foot falls asleep <coughs> in the middle of a run, and I've had somebody say that I, my shoe was too tight, so I loosened up the laces, but it still seems to happen. So I know that could be a myriad of different things. But it tends to happen mid-run and then goes away. Um, so I thought laces were too tight at first, but it's almost like a sciatica kind of thing, so I know it could probably be just about it. Again, yeah, it can be compression basically from each step, compression on the bottom of your foot, but it can be anywhere all the way up to your back getting some kind of a nerve compression. So typically what we would want to do is try and avoid whatever it is that leads to it if we can. If we can't, <laughs> then we need to investigate and see. But we need to see the pattern, so like specifically is it yeah. certain toes, a certain part of your leg, and then we try and identify where the nerve entrapment or the injury may yeah. be coming from. Yeah. You should go to physical therapy. <laughs> and then I usually send her to PT for nerve glide. Yeah. <laughs> Rest, physical therapy. But it's, it's been so inconsistent. I haven't had a, an ability to really isolate it because loosening the laces, I thought, well, maybe that's what it was, and it didn't get better on that particular run. But it I haven't figured it out yet. So yeah, physical therapy maybe, but <laughs> I don't know. Or you can come and see me. We'll, we'll arch supports <laughs> or any, I know, these sort of things are like, gosh, there could be. We'll, so we'll really, you know, annoy you with all our questions, trying to pin exactly <laughs> where you feel it what, right. or whatnot. But yeah, so that's, that's what we would do. That's random. It doesn't happen every time. So I just haven't gotten a handle on it yet. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? I okay. have a general one. <laughs> what do you think, like, if you're like an injury prone runner, what do you think the best way to not get injured is? Like, <coughs> do you want, like, I know, like, do you want the short answer? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you know, not doing too much too soon and like all that kind of stuff. Like, what do you think? Um, I know that's a really hard question. So, yeah, the answer to that is back down from what you're doing, work on your technique, make sure that you're following, you know, all the recommended protocols for, you know, your shoes, for your mileage. You know, I always tell people, don't increase, so there's like the rule of 10%, okay, there's that. Um, I always talk about um, intensity, duration, and frequency. So only increase one of those at a time, don't increase all three kind of the same idea. Um, but generally, it's usually a problem of doing too much too soon or too quickly or too hard. Um, if you take the time that you need to very gradually build, that's about the best way to avoid these overuse injuries. Now, the problem is runners get hurt, and then, you know, they run on it for a long time, and then I harass them enough until they finally rest, and then it gets better. And then they think that they can go right back to doing what they were doing right before the injury. 
and that's the, that's usually where the problem is. It's you gotta you gotta very gradually increase the activity.